Welcome to the After Talk at Universe University. I'm your host, Chris Grant. Today, we are humbled and honored to welcome an incomparable guest to our program, one of the greatest aerospace engineers of our time, and perhaps the greatest space visionary of all time, Dr. Robert Zubrin. He's the creator of the Mars Direct Proposal, the most efficient plan for sending human beings to the Red Planet. He is also the founder of the Mars Society and the author of many publications, including his latest book, The Case for Space. Today, I will be asking him about his life's work, his past collaborations with Elon Musk, the future plans of SpaceX, and the future of humanity's exploration of Mars and the universe beyond. Thank you so much for being on the program. It's an honor to speak with you, uh, Dr. Robert Zubrin. Your latest book is The Case for Space. And of course, you've got many other uh, amazing books uh, out there, but thank you again for taking the time to be on our program. Uh, my pleasure. So I have a couple of different questions that pertain to uh, both your career, uh, aerospace and astrospace engineering and then uh, also the politics of manned space exploration. Sure. My, my first question is, uh, unlike myself, I know that the Apollo moon landings happened within your lifetime, albeit your childhood, and I'm sure that you were inspired by them the way many children and indeed many adults were. Do you feel like you always knew you wanted to go into aerospace or astrospace uh, engineering from a young age, or is that something that happened later on in life? Well, um, it, it happened in my childhood, and uh, I, actually, I was a child when Sputnik flew. I was a teenager when we landed on the moon. Uh, and um, while the adults may have found uh, Sputnik terrifying, to me it was exhilarating because I was already reading science fiction, and uh, what Sputnik said to me was that all this stuff about the space for the future was going to be true. And so I was all in and my parents did encourage my interest. My father got me a telescope and did drawings of the moon through the eyepiece and we launched rockets and did all that kind of stuff. And, um, and then in the sixties, okay. Um, when, you know, I'm 10 and 12 and 14, um, you know, NASA was moving, okay, I mean, you know, person in orbit, two people in orbit, spacewalks, you know, orbiting the moon, and then finally landing on the moon, and, and, it, and then also probes to Venus and Mars, and, uh, the, 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 you know, there was some breakthrough practically every few months, something uh, more advanced uh, was achieved. Nuclear rocket engines were being tested in the desert. I mean, it was incredible. And the, the, and so I was all in. And, um, but then um, I graduated high school in 1970 and entered college the same year. And um, the whole thing began to grind to a halt. Um, and by the time I was in the middle of college, it was all done. And, uh, and furthermore, somehow the so-called real world got to me and said, look, it's fine to think you're going to be a space explorer when you're 12 years old. That's really cute. But in the real world, that's not the kind of job you can have. Okay. You can be a teacher, an accountant, or perhaps a lawyer, uh, or one of these things but you can't be a space explorer. That's for the people on the other side of the TV screen. Okay, the people who live in the world that exists on the other side of the TV screen, on this side of the TV screen, we are not that, okay? And, you know, I'm part of the first generation of my family that went to college. Um, and uh, so uh, it didn't even occur to me to go to graduate school, actually. 
uh, the, the, the general notion was you go to college, you get a better job and then you work, okay? So I became a teacher. Uh, I was a science teacher. Uh, it's a noble profession. Uh, it's part of the whole process of progress. Um, and, 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 you know, I was okay with that. But, but something didn't sit right with me with it. And about 10 years later, in the early 80s, um, you know, I'm living in northern Manhattan and teaching in Brooklyn and taking the subway each way an hour and 15 minutes and reading novels by Herman Melville about sailing the South Seas and saying to myself, you know, like, what am I doing here? Okay. <laughs> this isn't what I signed up for. Okay. And um, so I decided to go back to graduate school. Uh, by then I, I was acquainted with the concept and um, the, the, and became an engineer. And, and while I was doing that, I started hearing, about a group of people of my own generation, um, called themselves the Mars Underground, uh, who uh, many of them were graduate students at the University of Colorado, like Chris McKay, Carol Stoker, Penelope Boston, the main three of the most prominent, Tom Meyer. Um, and they were holding conferences called The Case for Mars. And they had not accepted this thing that you know, going to Mars was dreams of youth, and now the real world is, yes, we do space for reconnaissance satellites and communication satellites and stuff like that, but, you know, this other stuff is, you know, okay, Star Trek, lots of fun, but forget it, okay, uh, and uh, they hadn't accepted that, and I hadn't accepted that, so it turned out at the third Case for Mars conference, um, there was a thousand people there, Carl Sagan was there, uh, Tom Payne, who had been the head of NASA when we landed on the moon, was there. And I was just thrilled. I was all in. And I met someone there. Uh, ben Clark was the head of Mars Mission Studies at uh, Martin Marietta, which is now Lockheed Martin. And I talked to him. I said, I want to be part of your group and send me a resume. And a year later, I was working for him. Um, and that's how it happened. Um, so you went to work for Martin Marietta as a result of your affiliation uh, with the Mars Underground? Well, yeah. Um, Indirectly? I mean, or as a result of my interest in Mars, which certainly made me join the Mars Underground. And at the Mars Underground, I did meet the person who eventually got me into it professionally. So, yes. Did you have the chance to meet Carl Sagan or Tom Payne at that event? Yes, sure. yes I did. Um, so I, I got to know both of them. That must have been uh, incredible. Well, yeah, I mean, and Sagan, uh, if you look at the first edition of the case for Mars, uh, there's a strong endorsement by Sagan. Um, Tom Payne had died by then. Um, but, um, but yes, the new Sagan. So my next question then would be sort of the genesis of, of your Mars Direct idea. Obviously, you were thinking about it prior to uh, having this idea, but I wonder, was it simply the fact that President George H.W. Bush had laid out the Space Exploration Initiative and you, along with your colleague, David Baker, started thinking that perhaps the United States government was interested in, in going to Mars and you had a, a more efficient and more effective way of, of doing that? I'm just, I'm wondering, how a mind such as yours conceives of the idea and then how you get Martin Marietta, your employer, to then endorse it and kind of go along with it and say, yes, pursue this and develop this. Okay, so uh, 1989, okay, I'm already working at Martin. And President Bush the first gets up on the steps of the Air and Space Museum with uh, Armstrong and Aldrin and Collins, you know, right behind him. And he says, this is the 20th anniversary of the Apollo moon landing. That was great. That's what America is all about. And therefore, I, as president, am committing us to go back to the moon and on to Mars and this time to stay. Great stuff, right? So NASA went off and conducted an agency-wide study on how this might be accomplished. Uh, and because this took three months, they uh, called it the 90-day report. And... Um, and we at Martin were tasked to contribute uh, analysis and support this effort. And that included both myself and David Baker, and others. 
and uh, we thought it was crazy what they were doing um, because the way the 90 day report really was organized was to try to use the Mars mission to justify all the technology programs that NASA had currently or wished to have. In other words, they designed the most complex mission they possibly could in order to make everyone's pet technology mission critical. So it's like rewriting the school play in order to make sure that every kid has a speaking part. Okay, and this is the exact opposite of the correct way to do engineering. And it showed because when they came out with the 90 day report, they had a 30 year program with a cost of $400 billion, which in 1989 was considered real money. Um, you know, <laughs> last week, but the, um, okay. And, uh, uh, and, and it, it, that basically, uh, they killed it with sticker shock in Congress. And, um, we, uh, Baker, I, Ben Clark as well, uh, went to Martin's upper management and said, look, this is just nuts and we don't need this to go to Mars. And if this is how it's left, uh, if this is where the matter is, is, is left, there isn't going to be a space exploration initiative. This is going to be killed because of, of the enormous cost and the fantastical timeline that has been proposed. Uh, and we believe that we could put together a much better plan if you let us. And the management at Martin um, did something that was extremely unusual for aerospace management they decided that they would take on the customer as opposed to power of the customer, that is NASA, okay? They said, look, this is what you, I mean, literally, uh, and, and the guy, there's really one guy, uh, his name was Al Schallenmuller, he was a vice president at, at Martin Marietta Civil Space, and he, um, really an interesting fellow, and um, as a young engineer, he had worked for Kelly Johnson, uh, the, um, who, was the uh, head of the Lockheed Skunk Works, who was a, a genius at rapid development aerospace management. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But he didn't believe this had to take 30 years. Nothing has to take 30 years. He, and he called this 90-day report a, a waste, fraud, and abuse. Okay, And so under his protection, okay, because a lot of the other people in Martin and management were you know, you don't want to contradict the customer, okay? You don't want to show up NASA, okay? Um, so it's not going to be a program unless somebody does. So we formed this uh, scenario development team at uh, Martin. And it was composed of just 12 people from the whole gigantic company. The company was over 100,000 people. And, um, and I was one of them, Baker, Ben Clark, some others, um, and uh, largely fairly creative people. And um, and because of that, we could not agree with each other. Okay. And actually within the scenario development team, there was three plans that were put forward <coughs> that were all better than the NASA plan, but which disagreed with each other very substantially. Uh, ben Clark had his own plan and Baker and I had the Mars direct plan. There's a third plan. Um, and, Rather than attempt to reconcile them to come up with a company line, Schallemuller said, let's just propose all three to NASA and see which one catches fire. And, you know, let the flowers bloom where they may. And it was Mars Direct that caught fire. Um, and, uh, and it was really kind of amazing, actually, um, because I was not expecting um, the reception that we got. Um, to be as anywhere near as good as it was. Uh, the first place that we briefed it was at the NASA Marshall Space Flight Center, Huntsville. Right. And I thought they were going to throw us out of the room, you know, because you know, this was so different from the NASA paradigm. I thought, you know, I was going to say, you know, my daddy didn't do Mars missions this way, and his daddy didn't do Mars missions this way, and we don't need no damn Yankees coming down here to tell us how to do the cotton-picking Mars mission in this ridiculous way. Instead, they said, this is great. Um, and, and it was actually precisely because Marshall was the most conservative of the NASA centers, because 
And there were plenty of people at Marshall in 1989 who had done Apollo. It was only 20 years before. Okay. Uh, and there were Apollo veterans there, and there were even Von Braun team members there. And um, Conrad Dannenberg was there. Uh, and they looked at this and they said, we could do this. We could do this. In other words, they had been deluged with all these people coming up with plans to build three square kilometer solar electric ion drive spaceships built at floating spaceports. And it's like, this is bullshit, man. And then here we come along, we say, here's Mars Direct, and it's kind of like Apollo times two. Two Saturn V class vehicles. First one sends the Earth return vehicle, second sends the HAB module, rendezvous on the surface. The other one flies back with propellant that we can make on Mars. And they said, this is. Great. And, and they, one of the leaders there pulled me into his office and he said, look, you got to go to Johnson Space Center with this. And here's how you have to present it. This guy is going to be on your side. This guy is going to be against you. You, you know, he coached me the whole thing. And um, so we went to Johnson about a week later and boom, they loved it too. And then several other NASA centers. And so initially it was just a blitzkrieg, man. Uh, the, 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 uh, and, but then the space station people began a counterattack um, because um, they felt we were de-justifying them. They had posed, made, imposed a requirement on the 90-day report that in order to go to the moon, let alone Mars, you had to on, assemble this on orbit at the space station. Okay. And the space station was going to be the first step in this elaborate set of steps to eventually right. getting to Mars. And, and not just the space station that actually exists now, but a greatly expanded space station with on-orbit assembly facilities attached to it. Space Station uh, Freedom? Yeah, but this was a, it, it was a much bigger space station than what exists now. It had hangars and had all sorts of stuff. And then there were additional facilities floating nearby. And all this was a requirement before you even went to the moon. And in fact, there were people in NASA in 1989-90 who had sent people to the moon. And they were looking at this requirement that we build all this stuff first. And, 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 and they said, literally, if we could put a man on the moon, why can't we put a man on the moon? And, um, and this, of course, is very similar to the current situation. Uh, or at least the recent situation, which there are people at NASA saying before we can send people back to the moon, we need another space station orbiting the moon. Um, okay, so, um, and now there's more recently, there's been movement at NASA to push that requirement out of the critical path. Um, see, there's always going to be these people who say, you can't do your program until you do my program. And, um, and you got to get them out of the way if you're going to do your program. And um, so, but nevertheless, they're not going to like you. And um, so we had this big pushback from the, the, uh, the space station crowd, which was a more powerful crowd in NASA at that time than the uh, space exploration crowd because they had an actual program. Uh, so much more money going out for that and so forth, billions of dollars at stake. And and then to some extent, the shuttle people, uh, and the, who were the most powerful people in NASA. And um, uh, so it became controversial and it got turned from a blitzkrieg into trench warfare. Um, and um, eventually uh, Baker got frustrated and he left Martin, went to graduate school, and, and some other stuff, um, and so on. And with NASA not coming up with a unified view that we can do this, the Space Exploration Initiative was destroyed. However, during the um, ebb period of that, uh, Mike Griffin, much later he became NASA Administrator, but at this point he became Associate Administrator for Exploration. He had me come in and brief him. He liked it. He had me go back to Johnson Space Center with him telling them, look, you have to listen to this guy and, um, and design a mission plan, a NASA mission plan based on this form of thinking. And they did. And 
they developed their own version of Morris Direct, and it was enlarged compared to the one Baker and I had designed. It had a crew of six, a much bigger spacecraft, more equipment, heavier equipment, all sorts of stuff. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, they costed it out using the same costing models that they had used on the 90-day report. And the they had costed the 90-day report at $400 billion, and they costed the Mars Direct uh, program, uh, including both all the development and a, a number of missions, at uh, $55 billion. And, um, and I said, well, you know, you don't need this, you don't need that, you could trim this down. Uh, but uh, actually, Sagan uh, said to me, look, Bob, it doesn't matter whether it's 55 billion or 30 billion. It matters that it's tens of billions, not hundreds of billions. That's what matters. And in fact, uh, Newsweek then found out about it and uh, uh, wrote in, in July 1994, the 20th anniversary of the moon landing, it was the cover story. Uh, Mars is the next step, we can do it. Okay, and it was actually uh, as a result of that article that I got contacted by a literary agent who suggested I write a book, which eventually became The Case for Mars. Um, and, um, and led to the foundation of the Mars Society and all of that. Had they adopted it in 1990, you were confident that by the year 2000, uh, we would probably have boots on the ground on Mars, correct? That's right, that's right. In fact, my article in Aerospace America in uh, uh, either 89 or 90 was Humans to Mars by 1999. And, um, and that's what it was. And, and there were plenty of people in NASA at that time who were prepared to think that way because they had gotten people to the moon in eight years, starting from Kennedy's speech. They had done it, not other people that you could read about in history books. They had done it. Okay. And they knew they could do it. Okay. And Shalomir knew we could do it. Uh, and so that culture was still there. Uh, no longer dominant in NASA, but certainly present. And um, and now, you know, this has gotten to be a thing where the people who did Apollo are, they're historic people, they're not us. It's like reading about Lewis and Clark or something, you know. Uh, and, 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 and so this is, is very damaging. And, and, and to the extent that we allow this to recede into the historic past without reaffirming it as our tradition, the Mars mission becomes ever more difficult. Um, to the extent you, you get the conceit that you can't do it until you know it's safe. Okay. I mean, it, it, if that position is adopted, if that culture is adopted, you never go to Mars. Um, and, um, you know, the people who did Apollo were the younger brothers of the people that landed on Normandy Beach, okay? Uh, both the people who actually did it and the politicians who enabled it, okay? Uh, and, you know, they had a concept of how to do big projects and a willingness to take on risk to accomplish great goals and to work together to accomplish great goals. Um, and it's unfortunate we've seen not just a deterioration within NASA relative to that standard, but within the political class itself. Uh, I, I believe the current political class in the United States and Europe and does not compare to the political class of the 1960s. Um, you know, compare Trump to John F. Kennedy, compare uh, Boris Johnson to Winston Churchill, compare Macron to Charles de Gaulle. You know, I mean, uh, you know, these are Lilliputians. Um, and um, compared to the people that were there. And as a result, I think this is ultimately why we're now seeing this, um, a new force has entered the ring because nature abhors a vacuum. There's new leadership and it's coming from the entrepreneurial world. It, you know, in the 1960s, no one would have searched for an entrepreneurial savior for our space program. Okay, we had a great space program. We didn't need one. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and uh, the, but now you do. 
and we're getting one or more than one, okay? And of course, I'm talking about SpaceX, Elon Musk, and the other entrepreneurial efforts that um, are becoming quite real. Um, you know, the, the Rocket Lab, a company founded by not a billionaire, but a working engineer who managed to secure investment, they've reached orbit. And that's a New Zealand company. New Zealand doesn't even have a government space program. New Zealand has reached orbit through entrepreneurial initiative. And then you have this uh, spectacular uh, uh, success of, uh, of SpaceX, which has not only proven that it is possible for an entrepreneurial team to do things uh, at one-tenth the cost and one-third the time that a government-led space program can do, but even do things that that program had conceived as being impossible altogether, such as reusable launch vehicles. And this is, the aftershocks of this uh, have, have not even played out remotely because it's not only causing um, an entrepreneurial space race, it's causing entrepreneurial races in other fields, for example, controlled fusion, which is another field of, of you know, here's the future, fusion power, yeah, well, we've been hearing that since the 1960s. Where is it? Um, and then some people finally start saying, well, maybe the problem here isn't fundamentally technical. Maybe the problem is exactly what it was with Chief Space Launch, that it was institutional. And maybe the way to solve this problem isn't through gigantic government programs, but um, through uh, entrepreneurial startups. And, um, and so there are a number of fusion power startups that have gotten very serious investment. I'm talking hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, so um, I was going to ask, just getting back to uh, Mars Direct, uh, to my understanding, this was the first time uh, your idea for Mars Direct was the first time that someone had come up with the idea of making rocket fuel from the Martian atmosphere. Is that correct? Not exactly. Uh, certainly the idea uh, had been in science fiction. Um, and I think Arthur Clarke might have had something about it in the Sands of Mars. Um, the, in 1976, um, a JPL scientist named Robert Ash um, wrote an important paper in which I identified, he identified how you could make propellant on Mars. Um, and that included methane oxygen. Um, and he was looking at it from the point of view of Mars sample return. Um, but the Mars Direct was the first time that someone who was really in the business uh, proposed this seriously as uh, the enabling technology and not just something that you might do later to enhance a Mars mission architecture, okay, but rather that how the whole mission architecture would be revised radically uh, if you approach it from the point of view of this technology. So for example, um, you know, the assumption had always been that uh, certainly since Apollo, that the way you return from a planet, whether it's the moon or Mars, is through an orbit rendezvous strategy so that you don't need to bring to the surface of the planet the propellant you need to take off, okay? And, um, but if you can make the propellant on the surface of the planet, then, for example, lunar orbit rendezvous as practiced in Apollo, or Mars orbit rendezvous as assumed by von Braun, um, is no longer the correct strategy because now you can do direct return from the surface at, uh, with tremendous advantage. And this is why we adopted, a, a, in other words, Mars Direct is a radically different mission architecture. There's no mothership in Mars orbit, okay? And uh, this is, of course, what we set forth, and it's what Elon Musk has embraced as well, because the, his architecture is uh, a kind of a variant of Mars Direct, but it is direct to the Martian surface, direct return using in situ propellant. So uh, from this, you went on to found the Mars Society, and obviously one of the predominant goals there is to promote uh, human exploration of the surface of Mars, but I wonder, uh, so many years on, what is the Mars Society's day-to-day, -day, what are their day-to-day -day operations uh, like in terms of their mission? Well, the Mars Society exists to promote the 
exploration and settlement of Mars by both public and private means. Um, we do basically three activities. One is uh, general outreach to spread the vision. The second is political work to defend the various Mars programs, including the robotic Mars programs funded by NASA, which are very good programs um, and in the political sphere. And the third being projects of our own, uh, the most noteworthy of which has been the uh, Mars Desert Research Station, the uh, Mars Arctic Research Station, and also the University Rover Challenge that we have uh, every year. Um, in which uh, dozens of university-based teams compete to build uh, Mars rovers and test them in the desert and compete them in the desert. Um, now, you can assign precise metrics to the, the political work and to some extent to the um, Mars station work. You could say we've had this many crews, we've had this many rover teams, uh, so many students have been involved, and so forth. You know, this political program we successfully defended, we saved the Curiosity rover, we did this. Um, okay, fine. But actually, I believe that it's the first task is the most important. Um, because, uh, you know, Victor Hugo said, nothing can stop an idea whose time has come. And the reason why that is true is because if the idea is time has come and if someone spreads it, it will recruit to its banners the forces necessary for its implementation. And so, you know, so the idea is the, the, what moves history. It is the idea that has recruited Elon Musk. Elon Musk is not being driven to do SpaceX by the lure of profit. He could make a lot more money doing things that are a lot easier than having a rocket company. Okay, he's doing this because he believes in it. Okay, and we had a role in that. Um, he read the case for Mars, he came to a Mars Society, then he joined our board for a while, and then he decided that he could be much more effective operating on his own, and, and that's great. And, but you, know, you can never tell where these ideas are going to land, okay, whether it's going to be a Musk, or, uh, well, the idea that captured Bezos was the Gerard O'Neill's ideas of a space companies. That's another example. It's a different example. Um, but that's how the richest man in the world was recruited to um, um, uh, the, the, devote his talents and resources to this. And Some there of are this, any uh... number of of engineers, I mean, if you look at the SpaceX team, man, okay, which is the greatest rocket team, at least since Apollo, and um, the people there are extremely motivated. Um, many of them are, are, were founding members of the Mars Society uh, and are otherwise recruited to believe in this and be willing to work, you know, uh, twice as hard as people at any other aerospace company for 70% the pay because they're there to make the revolution. They're not there to have a comfortable living. And, uh, um, and that, that's very much part of it being, you know, morale is decisive in war and in research and development. So some of this ties into my next question. And uh, in Ashley Vance's biography of Elon Musk, it seems like you played a, a crucial role, almost like a mentor to the young Elon Musk. He was dreaming about space exploration and having these uh, intellectual fantasies about uh, space exploration. And he, he sought you out and you were quoted as saying that he was clearly a, a highly intelligent person, but at the time really didn't know anything about space or space technology. Is that an accurate assessment of your first impressions of him? Yeah, sure. Uh... He was uh, clearly highly intelligent. He also had a good scientific background. He, he had a degree in physics, but he didn't know anything about rocketry that's, uh, or rockets that existed or the Mars or what was needed. He, now, some of that he learned from us, but a lot of it, he, he uh, most of what he learned, he learned on his own because he, he cracked the books. He turned himself into a first-class rocket engineer. And that, that didn't come from me, that came from him. Um, but I would say 
that Musk's achievements are his own. Uh, I just helped recruit him. But his idea to uh, make fuel from the Martian atmosphere, that's very central well, to- that, that came from me, yeah, sure. Uh, and he but, talks about but, that as being very central to uh, his plan for Mars exploration and colonization. Yeah, it is. Okay. But once again, the key is the recruitment. Um, recruit, you know, look, if, if he managed to figure out a way to do Mars without making propellant on Mars, that would suit me fine too. Uh, I, 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 it, it, it's, it, the, the real thing is that he's devoting his talent to this cause instead of uh, you know, what most people of his type do, which is devote their talents to the endless pursuit of profit. Right. Uh, so going back to that same uh, biography, there's a section that talks about uh, you had a desire to send mice into outer space and place them on this uh, spinning spacecraft that would simulate uh, a, about the gravity of the planet Mars to get back some, I guess, biomedical data on how Mars gravity might affect human beings someday. Do you think that that might still be a worthy project for any uh, public or private entity to pursue? Or was that something that you were just entertaining at the time? No, it, it'd be very worthwhile to do um, because um, currently there's no data of the effect of one third gravity on humans or mammals. Absolutely. Uh, it's, it, it's frankly, it's a scandal. Uh, you know, we've been in orbit since 1958 and um, we have yet, NASA has yet to fly a single artificial gravity spacecraft. Uh, you know, and, uh, and, and, and frankly, there's a problem there because the NASA space medicine community is controlled by zero gravity health effects researchers. And so they uh, are, are, are opposed to research on artificial gravity uh, because it would threaten their bowl of rice. And, the, 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 um, and in fact, you really want to go to Mars using artificial gravity. You could, I mean, you can go to Mars in zero gravity. Six months in zero gravity is a standard rotation on, on the space station. But the people who come down from the space station come in a weakened condition. And we're not going to Mars just to say we went there. We're going to Mars to explore and hiking around in a spacesuit is physical activity. And, and so um, you're, you're greatly uh, weakening the cost effectiveness of the mission if you go to Mars in zero gravity. And so there's two issues here. One is Mars gravity. And you know we want to be on Mars for a year and a half. Will that uh, weaken people to the same extent or a comparable extent to zero gravity? Or will it be much more like Earth gravity in terms of, of medical effects? Okay. And the other is simply artificial gravity for transit craft. Um, and um, the, uh, so that needs to be done. And uh, I mean, frankly, NASA should just do it. Uh, and uh, it's it's crazy. I mean, here we are, sixty years into the space age, and we've yet to fly a few mice or rhesus monkeys, let alone people. And in fact, there, I'm not a big fan of the Orion capsule because I think it's too big and heavy to be good for a reentry capsule from coming back from the moon, uh, and it's too small to be a trans-Mars spacecraft. But one thing that it would be very good for would be a kind of a temporary artificial gravity space station in Earth orbit. You could launch an Orion to Earth orbit with a crew in it, tether it off the, 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 the upper stage that delivered it to Earth orbit. And spin then sp the, spin it, yeah. Spin it, and then you could have astronauts, not just you know, human astronauts in this case, experience Mars gravity for a month or so because the thing could, I mean, it's big enough to last a fair amount of time in, in space. And, and then at the end of the time, cut the tether, re-entry and land. It's ideal for that, for that mission. Um, I'd like to see NASA do that. That would be a great first step. Yeah. So uh, what Elon Musk has done with SpaceX is uh, undeniably brilliant and it's transformed the industry of space. Obviously that cannot be 
uh, understated. And while you both share the dream of sending human beings to Mars, it seems like you and Elon Musk uh, don't always see eye to eye. And furthermore, he sometimes makes uh, predictions and sets timetables that fall short. Um, he announced at one time that he wanted to send human beings to orbit the moon in the year 2018, and uh, that hasn't happened. And so I wonder, do you think uh, Elon Musk vacillates between being a brilliant and pragmatic entrepreneur and simply being a man who lets his imagination uh, run away with him? And he, indeed, he said that science fiction novels had influenced him to, to found SpaceX. And I guess the question that I'm kind of asking is, uh, should all of us learn to separate our fantasies about space travel from the pragmatic realities of space travel? Or should we go the other direction and embrace the idea that anything is possible and that yesterday's science fiction will be tomorrow's science fact? Well, you do have to distinguish them, but you don't want to lose your imagination. You know, the slogan of the great British Interplanetary Society, of which I'm proud to be a member, is from imagination to reality. And that's what uh, space travel is. It is a question of taking an idea, which really, you know, it's, it's not something that's happening around us, but then saying, this is an idea, we can conceive it, we're going to do it, we're going to create it. Now, Musk, okay, he tends to be rather optimistic in his projections. Um, and so you could say that relative to his projections, he underperforms. But relative to anyone else, he vastly overperforms. Um, and, you know, um, you know, Musk gave this speech last October in Texas. I think a lot of people saw it on the internet. Uh, it was very dramatic in which he kind of unveiled the first Starship prototype. He had just flown it, uh, it uh, at low altitude from some tens of kilometers from one place to another in Texas. Um, and, and then it was at night, and it was dramatic, and he says, we're going to be reaching Earth orbit in six months. And, okay, well, uh, it'll be six months in a couple of weeks. And, um, the, and I, I wrote at that time, I figure two years. Um, and they'll reach or Earth orbit in two years. Uh, now, and a lot of people who were Musk supporters, um, so, you know, he says six months, and say, look, two years, it's pretty good. Nobody else could do it in two years. <laughs> I mean, here's SLS. I was on the team that did the preliminary design of SLS in 1988. That's 32 years. Okay, the, uh, and okay, well, okay, well, that's a scandal. But even Saturn V, which was done by the Von Braun team, was five years from contract signing to first flight. And this is, okay, two years. I think he'll do it in two years. I think uh, uh, Starship will reach uh, Earth orbit sometime in late 2021. Uh, maybe it'll be three years. But who else is doing that? Uh, I mean, fair point, you know, so the, the, and, and, and here's another thing about Musk. Okay. He, he is certainly an unusual character. Um, and uh, obviously he's extremely intelligent. And one adjective that is frequently used in association with him is genius. Um, an adjective that rarely is used in association with him is wisdom. Um, but actually, I believe that in at least one critical respect, Musk is very wise, um, unusually wise, in that he understands something that very few people of his age understand, which is that he doesn't have forever. Um, this is not something that Jeff Bezos, who appears to be a more balanced person, understands. Bezos thinks he has forever. He doesn't. He may have enough money to last forever, but none of us last forever. And, um, 
the the so there's an urgency in Musk. Okay, here he is. He's maybe 49 years old or so. So he's got perhaps 20 more years of work at the height of his powers, and uh, and 30 altogether, perhaps. Uh, and he's got to force this down. Even so, if even if you take, for instance. You know the the disagreement that I have with him on on the Starship, in which I believe that it, that in parallel with the full size Starship, they should make a mini Starship that is sized to be the upper stage of the Falcon Nine, and which could be lifted with its fuel all the way to Earth orbit by the big Starship, and then it could travel to Mars and let the big Starship stay in geocentric space. He doesn't want to do that. Okay, why does he not want to do that? Because he wants to do this as fast as possible and having only one thing to develop in his view is the way to do it as fast as possible. And his attitude is show me why I need it. I don't believe I need it. Show me why I need it. And so even though our conclusions on that question diverge, he is right in his attitude. His attitude of show me why I need it is exactly the right attitude. Okay, it's exactly the opposite uh, of NASA's attitude, which is uh, show me all the things that might be useful to me um, that I can work on before I actually take on the problem at hand. Okay, they are reversed. So his attitude is correct. Show me why I need it. Okay, I want to do this with as, as little development as possible. I want to get on Mars as soon as I can. Um, that's the right attitude. Uh, and um, um, so I have a lot of respect for that. So <clears throat> obviously uh, the fact that we're currently dealing in the United States and in the world at large, we're currently dealing with a, a pandemic and that can slow down the progress of science and technology in other areas. Uh, keeping that in mind, uh, would you care to offer any predictions for when human beings might walk on the surface of Mars uh, in the near future. Obviously, if it was left in the hands of NASA, I might predict never. But with Elon Musk, SpaceX, Blue Origin, Jeff Bezos in the game. Well, there's a lot of chance in this kind of thing. Okay, I mean, look, here we have this black swan event happening right now, which could completely disrupt the world. On the other hand, you know, three weeks from now, this whole thing may have disappeared. Uh, so, you know, there's a distinction there between something where people say, oh my God, what a false alarm, how foolish we were to do all this. And the other hand, uh, civilization collapsing. Okay, that, that's quite a spread uh, in, in, in potential outcomes here. Um, and, but if we assume that this, maybe not false alarm, but nevertheless, uh, the, the the threat of, of millions of deaths recedes, it's tens of thousands, and this just becomes part of the new normal, and by this time next year there are vaccines, and you take one every year like the flu, uh, so that basically the kind of civilization that we thought was normal and that we were entitled to does in fact continue. Um, in that case, I th and, and if Musk does not have a misstep, which he could have, because he skates pretty close to the edge of the ice. Um, I think that we will have people on Mars by the end of this decade. Uh, on the other hand, okay, if civilization continues but Musk fails, which could happen, they could have a big explosion, 20 people are killed, there's an investigation, negligence is found, whatever, or he just tweets something stupid and the SEC prosecutes him, um, you know. God forbid. God forbid, but you know, okay. And so SpaceX is out of the game. It might take an additional 10 years. Uh, but because NASA has predicted the late 2030s, and I feel like this is a deadline that keeps getting pushed further and further down the road in terms of NASA. NASA prediction. does not have a serious plan to send humans to Mars right now. This is this is all sizzle, no stink. Okay, uh, 
and even their commitment to send people to the moon is uh well there's some commitment there but it's 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 distorted it you have various interferers who if this program was truly serious would be thrown out of the room by now um and um but it's certainly not mars their their mars program is a uh, human mars program is a joke their 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 robotic mars program is serious okay and it has made major accomplishments and will continue to do so it is purpose driven uh it is not vendor driven okay uh and the moon program is significantly vendor driven and the, their human mars program is not driven at all the 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 um and but that could change for example um let's say we do have starship flying to earth orbit in 2022 okay which i think is a reasonable assumption okay okay that's three years from musk's speech okay i, I think he can do it in which case by 2024 the starships are regularly going to earth orbit and um fully reusable heavy lift launch vehicle saturn V class fantastic capability we're going to have an election in 2024 presumably and um if starships are flying regularly to earth orbit by 2024 whoever's elected president is going to look at his or her advisors and say look at this look at this could we have people on mars by the end of my second term and the answer is going to be yes and is it going to cost hundreds of billions of dollars no is it going to cost tens of billions of dollars well it may cost 10 billion dollars well then let's do it and at that point you have a public private partnership at that point nasa becomes driven from the president okay to work with spacex in other words by making the mission feasible he makes it sellable and and at that point we go to mars and um putting the capabilities of spacex together with the capabilities that nasa can mobilize because believe me there are plenty of good people in nasa okay even now there are there's outstanding technical talent in nasa but it, 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 it's not being mobilized with the proper sense of direction and urgency um and but if that bell rings there are people that will show up at the flagpoles so um, I have a few engineering questions here, and I hope you'll bear with me because I myself am not an engineer. Uh, but as, as I understand it, these new uh, Raptor engines that SpaceX wants to use uh, will have the highest chamber pressure of any such engine ever built. And uh, do you foresee this being a, a problem in the short term or the long term, or do you think that they'll prove to be a, a new innovation? I think it will present challenges in the short term, but that they will solve them. Um, I don't see anything fundamentally difficult about this. I, it's one of these things that, that you have to do right, and uh, they are going to be forced to take that on, but this is, is they're well equipped to solve this. Uh, the other question I had was regarding um, building using carbon fiber, carbon fiber composites, which uh, some aerospace engineers have said this might be a mistake because uh, they're tough to repair on Earth, let alone in uh, outer space. And, and this ties into a, a broader question I have. Do you think, it sounds like overall you think the vehicles that SpaceX wants to send to Mars are, uh, are good vehicles. Uh, do you think that you would recommend something different, perhaps something simpler? Well, I'd recommend something smaller um okay. the um that is my preferred architecture would be to use the starship not to go all the way to mars and back uh but just to uh, be heavy lift vehicle to low earth orbit uh i mean just one obvious advantage of that is you get to use the starship again the next week instead of three years later uh so you get far more utility out of it um the the but also um, the amount of propellant needed to send a starship home from Mars is about 10 times as large as really is needed for an Earth return vehicle. You know, even in his colonization architecture, 
okay, where well, he wants to move hundreds of thousands of people to Mars. He, he doesn't want to move hundreds of thousands of people from Mars to Earth. Um, so if you actually did deliver a starship to Mars, I would just keep it there because it's an apartment building all put together already. Um, but the way I would do, ex and, and, and for exploration missions, it's vastly oversized. Um, but for a reusable heavy lift booster, what's not to like? And if he made a, a mini starship, which would be kind of like starship, except that it it'd be at most a fifth the size, it would be uh, about size to be the upper stage, a reusable upper stage on a Falcon 9, um, which means the whole lower stage development doesn't need to be done. It's already done. In fact, they're already built and proven. Um, and you're just doing this. And that combination by itself would be a, an attractive uh, commercial medium lift launch system. But the real reason why I want it is you could put it inside the Starship, fully fueled, the Starship lifts it to Earth orbit and it then just flies to Mars and with the crew. And you could pre-land one on Mars without the crew and have it make its propellant and be a Mars Direct style Earth return vehicle, single stage instead of minus two stages, but fine. Um, and you would need like one tenth the amount of propellant that you need to send a big Starship home. And that means that the whole, in situ resource utilization system on Mars and the amount of power needed to run it and so on can all be scaled down by it by an order of magnitude. And that's of enormous value. That's why I'm recommending that they do that. Now, I know there were some people at, at SpaceX, uh, perhaps even Musk, who for a while looked, were looking at a mini starship from the point of view of being a precursor to um, uh, the starship. And Musk rejected that because he didn't want to put a whole development stage ahead of building the Starship. Okay, I actually agree with his point of view on that. I would not want to make this as a precursor to Starship. I'd make it as a parallel development um, because it is um, something that will help the Starship do its mission better because it cuts the uh, propellant making requirement on Mars by an order of magnitude. And uh, also uh, it makes the Starship easier because first of all, you'll need less of them if you can reuse them every week instead of every three years. But aside from that, um, this re-entering the atmosphere from Earth orbit is not as challenging as re-entering it from a trans-Earth trajectory from Mars. You're coming into the atmosphere much faster if you're coming back from Mars. And so you need more thermal protection. And why impose that requirement on the Starship? Um, Alternatively, you've, you've said that perhaps uh, NASA or the United States government should work on creating some sort of uh, heavy Mars lander, perhaps if uh, Elon Musk is completely devoted to the Starship. Is that correct? Well, that, that's an alternative as well. Okay, yeah, I mean, why are we asking Elon Musk to do everything? Um, and if this was a public-private partnership, then yeah, the head, I mean, okay, the mini Starship is a heavy Mars lander, but you could create a different kind of one. You could do a, a more conventional one of basically a Mars Direct style lander. Uh, so once again, you use the Starship as a fully reusable Saturn V class launcher and in this sense, a starship could enable Artemis as well. I, I don't believe in trying to land starships on the moon. I think that that's crazy. Yeah, uh, you, you once said that trying to land, sending starships to the moon was the equivalent of trying to take an aircraft carrier whitewater rafting. Isn't that right? Yeah, yeah. Aircraft carriers are great, but you don't use them for whitewater rafting. Uh, <laughs> you know, you use a much smaller boat for that. And the the you trying to land a starship on the moon, there'd be a gigantic plume impingement problem. You dig a crater. Now, maybe you could land a starship on the moon after someone's built a lunar base and you've got these nice pads there all laid out, with, you know, that, that can take the plume of the starship. But, but that's not the situation we're in. We need to land the first right. crew. And um, so the fact that the starship is not the right vehicle for all applications is not a criticism of Starship. It, there are things 
that are useful for certain things that are not useful for other things. Okay, you know, use a can opener to open up a can of tuna fish. You don't use a hand grenade. And the, the uh, you know, and, and, and the, so the Starship, yeah, it's like an aircraft carrier and, and you don't use it for whitewater rafting. So um, I had a question regarding uh, reusability. In uh, our podcast, we spoke with a NASA historian, former NASA historian, uh, Alex Rowland, regarding the American Space Shuttle program. And we could probably talk uh, for hours about the uh, problems with the American uh, Space Shuttle program. But uh, one of the things that stood out to me was that they said creating a reusable space vehicle would be much cheaper and it turned out to be much more expensive, both in terms of money and indeed in terms of human lives. Uh, refurbishing the space shuttle was an expensive process. And I think to this day, reusing spacecraft uh, does involve spending a lot of money on refurbishing them. And so my question is, do you think uh, some of the results of the, and some of the failures of the space shuttle program undercut the idea that reusability is fundamental and key to uh, the space industry and to making space travel cheaper? Well, okay, the shuttle, first of all, was not really reusable. It was more salvageable. Um, and um, <clears throat> so it, it was neither fish nor fowl as, as far as that is concerned. And certainly, the shuttle was so complex that um, the idea of rapid reusability, even if they had had a launch manifest that would have supported that, um, was not possible. Also, there's another problem with shuttle, which was institutional in nature, uh, which was that the shuttle was designed to keep NASA in existence on something like the scale it had existed in Apollo. In other words, the shuttle was not, as far as NASA was concerned, if you could have designed something like Starship that, you know, could be launched and, and supported with a few hundred people, that would not have their needs. <laughs> they needed something that needs thousands of people. Um, because, see, the, 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 the situation, okay, there's a general problem with bureaucracies, and this is government agencies, political parties, trade unions. This is a, a, a general problem, which is that these organizations are founded for a purpose. Okay, a political party might be founded for a cause. Okay, it is mission driven. You trade unions, same thing. Okay, but after a certain amount of time, the organization assumes a different character where its chief purpose is to preserve itself as an organization. Okay, and you can look at all, 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 all these sorts of things and, and you see this. Okay. Um, and so NASA was born as a mission-driven organization, Apollo. Okay. But post-Apollo, it became a typical organization whose uh, interest in preserving its own existence tended to um, prevail over the idea of, of, of accomplishing something. I, in other words, Actually, when I proposed Mars Direct, I was approached by a middle-level NASA official and told me a scientist, look, you know, uh, there's something you need to understand. The last thing NASA would want is to get to Mars in 10 years. Um, wow. Okay. Now, that was a somewhat cynical point of view, and there are certainly many people in NASA who would have loved to get to Mars in 10 years. But the bureaucracy as a whole, if you view NASA as an organism, Okay, it wasn't in its interest to get to Mars in 10 years. Okay, and the shuttle was created really as a way to keep NASA alive. 
to, you know, and as you have this tremendous organization that's put together with all Johnson Space Center and Langley and, and all these things and, uh, and everybody has got to be given something to do or they're going to go away. So the shuttle did preserve NASA as a force in being. And there's something to be said for that, to keep it as a, I mean, look, we're doing this right now with this um, coronavirus stimulus bill. We're trying to keep a bunch of businesses around because if, if they are not around, then all those people that are being laid off will have nowhere to go back to. Uh, and so, sure, it makes sense to do this sort of thing as a temporary measure, but for decades. That's a different story. Uh, and the, uh, so the shuttle could not have been efficient. Okay. And, uh, and it wasn't. Now, when we designed Mars Direct, we did not include reusable vehicles, uh, except for the fact that the vehicles that stayed on Mars continued to be used, but, but the launcher was not a reusable launcher and so forth. We said, look, okay, reusable vehicles don't exist and I'm not prepared to say I can't go to Mars until I have reusable vehicles. Okay, you know, in other words, there certainly were people out there saying you can't do your program to do my program. Wait for X33. I mean, but the, the, the um, but in terms of the long term in space and Musk's vision definitely is the long term. It's not about establishing a first scientific base on Mars. Mars Direct certainly wasn't flags and footprints. It was serious exploration. Um, in the long term, if you want colonization, you have to reduce costs enough so that it can be um, you know, uh, readily doable for people of middle financial means, and therefore it has to be reusable. But your feeling so, is that in regards to the American Space Shuttle, that uh, the failures of, of that program have far less to do with reusability and far more to do with the bureaucracy of NASA. Yes. Okay. Um, so we hear a lot of educated, seemingly intelligent people uh, that talk in very dire terms about traveling to Mars. Uh, they talk about lower gravity on the surface psychological challenges, and perhaps most of all, exposure to radiation. And some of them seem to see it as a, a showstopper. And uh, it's your position, particularly in regards to uh, radiation, that a lot of these concerns are overblown, uh, perhaps even alarmist. Is that correct? Yeah, sure. And I have a background in this area. My doctorate is in nuclear engineering. And I did work for a while uh, for the Office of Radiation Protection of Washington State. Um, and so I, I have a, a quantitative view of this. And um, the radiation doses that you would get going to Mars and back are higher than the occupational limits for nuclear power plant workers. But those limits are designed so that if you have a, a, a workforce of thousands of people, you'll have no incidence of uh, uh, the cancer or, or something. Okay. The, 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 they're not for a group of people who, you know, I mean, look, the space shuttle, okay, they could say that they had, you know, six nines of reliability on the space shuttle, but the actual track record of the space shuttle was 98% reliable. Right. Okay. Uh, that is one in 50 or so space shuttle launches entailed loss of crew. It was very dangerous. Well, it, dangerous by that standard. On the other hand, by the standard of previous ages of exploration, having 49 missions out of 50 succeed is extremely high reliability. Um, and, uh, you know, um, and by the standards of, you know, air raids over, you know, Nazi Germany in World War II, having 49 planes out of 50 return. And, uh, of course. Yeah, okay. Now, the, 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 so you have to understand what you're talking about here. So it would be wonderful if we could do a Mars mission with the same level of safety as the space shuttle. Okay. And look, how many people 
if you told him, look, there's a chance to choose the shuttle, they lost two out of 130 or something, would you like to fly on the space shuttle? Okay. Millions of people would say yes. I would certainly okay. say yes. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. So even knowing those, those are the real odds. Okay. You don't believe the guys with the five nines. Just here it is. Two were lost, 130 flew. You're at bat. Want to go? Um, right. The answer is yes. And if you have a Mars mission, okay, it would be wonderful, in fact, if we could have 90% mission success rate, okay? That, because the Mars mission is certainly at least five times as complicated as the shuttle mission. Uh, Neil Armstrong talked about uh, the chances of a successful landing on Apollo 11 being as low as 50-50. So the Apollo program was, was dangerous in its own right. Calculated yeah, risks. No, look, those guys were test pilots. They knew this was risky. Nobody was drafted to do it, okay? Um, and so this is voluntary. And Anyway, the radiation risk, if you want to know, of going to Mars and back, uh, based on the best models we have, and which are very conservative models, by the way, uh, is about a 1% risk of getting a fatal cancer sometime later in your life, assuming that there's no advance in medical technique in the next quarter century. And the, uh, so it's really a modest portion of total mission risk, okay? Uh, it is a much lower risk than tens of millions of people voluntarily assume by smoking. Um, you know, because the average American smoker adds a 20% risk of fatal cancer to themselves just for whatever pleasure they get out of smoking. Um, as opposed to the joy you would get out of being the first human on Mars. I mean, the... Uh, sure. Uh, okay. why, do you, why do you think that this uh, negative attitude... Uh, is so prevalent. Uh, you've spoken about uh, individuals at NASA being very protective of their pet projects. And so I would, I would be tempting. Well, there's, to there's three groups that like to play up the radiation danger. Okay. One is the radiation health effects researchers themselves who want to have a bowl of rice. The second is the advanced propulsion people who want to say, you can't go to Mars unless you can go much faster than you currently can. And so you can't do it until you you, know, you can't do your program until you do our program. And then finally, there's the people who just don't want to accept the challenge of humans to Mars. <laughs> and uh, so there's th those three groups in play. Okay. But it is a modest portion of total mission risk, as proven, by the way, by the fact that um, there's, at this point, about a dozen people, astronauts and Russian cosmonauts, who have because of extended durations on the space station, actually receive cosmic ray doses comparable to what they would have gotten going to Mars and back. And we see no radiological health effects on these people. We see some zero gravity health effects, which NASA militantly refuses to address because they want to have zero gravity health effects. Uh, you know, you have people saying we should have a lunar orbiting space station so astronauts can experience cosmic rays. Which, I mean, so in other words, there's a total uh, disingenuousness to this, um, where the most serious health effects of space flight are, are which could readily be uh, mitigated or prevented, are, are, are not being dealt with, and where they have other programs which are willfully accepting uh, uh, this radiation dose, uh, even, uh, um, you know, uh, saying that's what they want to do. Um, now, I think radiation doses should be minimized, um, and there's ways to do that. Um, the basic philosophy is called as low as reasonably achievable, ALARA is the slogan. And sure, you can uh, build the spacecraft in a way in which the most mass is between the crew and the sun and this and that. And there are things you can do, and you can go on six-month trajectories without too much difficulty. You don't have to take eight months to get to Mars. But basically, this is what's in the cards. And uh, the risk of space launch, of flight through interplanetary space, re-entry, landing on Mars, Mars surface operations, takeoff from Mars, trans-Earth injection, re-entry and landing at Earth, and of uh, critical systems, life support systems, and so forth, failing uh, for whatever cause in some point or another. These are much larger risks than the radiation risk. So um, I wanted to 
shift gears to uh, the politics uh, as we uh, close up here. I have an educational background in uh, public administration and political science. And so I was very intrigued uh, to hear a comment that you made that tracking the trajectory of a spacecraft is uh, relatively easy when compared with tracking uh, an idea's path through a political system. Yes. And I'm both intrigued and disheartened by the fact that we haven't yet landed human beings on Mars. And you actually wrote a fascinating book that really wasn't focused on space travel. It was called Merchants of Despair, where you spoke a, of an ideology uh, called anti-humanism. And I wonder if this ideology is a roadblock to human space exploration. And we hear so much about the technical challenges of getting to Mars. Uh, I wonder if you could speak to some of the political and ideological challenges that we face as those might be more serious. Well, I believe that anti-humanism is not merely a threat to the space program, it's a threat to our civilization. Um, it is the main threat to our civilization. Um, that is, if you look at the great catastrophes of the 20th century, um, they were not caused by resource exhaustion, environmental pollution, global warming, or asteroid impacts, or pandemics. They were caused by bad ideas. And in particular, one bad idea in a number of different uh, costumes. And that bad idea is that there isn't enough to go around. And if there isn't enough to go around, then all nations are fundamentally enemies. Uh, and we have to fight it out to see who's going to get what little there is. And this idea in various forms is the underlying cause of uh, World War I, World War II, the Holocaust, the Holodomor, and any other number of uh, horrific episodes of the last century. And, and it is what threatens us in the coming century. Okay, Germany never needed living space. That was all in their minds. Okay, Germany today is much smaller than the Third Reich. It has a larger population and yet a vastly higher standard of living. Why? Because of the advance of science to technology, partially accomplished by Germans, but much more accomplished by people all over the world, including notably people they were trying to exterminate. So the entire program was insane. Germany did not become rich as it is today by stealing other people's land or their cows. Okay, they, they, they did by uh, taking part in global progress, a, a, a global project of the advance of science and technology and the human horizons that go along with that. And, the, uh, and their entire war effort was entirely destructive towards those goals. Um, the, the, so, and here we are. I mean, look, I, I can tell you for a fact, because I've spoken to them, that there are people in our national security establishment in Washington, D.C., who believe that war with China is inevitable. Why? Well, because there's only so much oil in the world, and if the Chinese develop and become a fully developed country, uh, comparable to the US or even Europe, so that most people have cars, there won't be enough oil in the world. Okay? And you could bet your bottom dollar that there are people exactly like them looking at this thing from the opposite side of the chessboard in Beijing and thinking exactly the same thing from their point of view. And if, if this sort of thinking is allowed to prevail, there will be wars and they will be far more destructive than the wars of the 20th century because our weaponry is far more effective. And the, the, uh, this is the threat to civilization. Now, the issue, as I say, we didn't have World War I or II because there was a resource shortage. The world was richer in August 1914 than it had ever been before in human history. Okay, and the, 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 and yet they decided to tear each other apart. And the, 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 it's not a question of um, there being too many people and sending them to Mars. We're not in danger from there being too many people. We're in danger from people who think there are too many people. Um, and 
it's not a question of getting oil from Mars or something of this sort, okay? No, it's a question of refuting this conceit that there's only so much to go around by making it clear to people that it's not true that there's only so much to go around because the earth comes with an infinite sky and it's wide open. That's very and well that's said. for space right there. So I uh, desperately want to hope for the best in the coming decades uh, of human sp space exploration. And I admit that maybe we're getting ahead of ourselves, but I wanted to ask you about the idea of uh, landing sites on Mars, and if there are any particular areas that perhaps you had, had thought about. Um, obviously, safety is a concern, and uh, I think back to Carl Sagan's words in his uh, book Cosmos when he was talking about the Viking space probes in the 1970s that landed on Mars, uh, where he said, quote, our search for safe harbors led us to landing sites that were by and large uh, dull, and I imagine, um, end quote, so I imagine that will be a concern for the first human mission uh, to Mars also. So I wonder if, if you had gotten that far in thinking about the first places we might want to land and then subsequent well, missions as well. Well, I think, uh, well, first of all, compared to Viking, we're in much better shape. We have Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter has been there now since 2005, uh, taking photographs of the whole planet in high resolution. We, we pretty much know lots of places where we can land safely, which we did not know at the time of Viking. And a human craft, simply because it's larger than a robotic craft, um, you know, a, a one foot or two foot boulder that might have presented a problem for Viking would not be a problem at all for a human scale lander, okay? Um, the, the, so there's that, but the, um, in terms of where I would go, um, we now know that there's places where there's pure water ice on Mars as far south as 38 degrees north, which is the latitude of San Francisco on Earth. So you don't need to go to the pole to get ice. That's very important. Uh, so I would choose a mid-latitude site that did have access to water ice and which was in a scientifically interesting area. That's, and also low altitude, the air is thicker, better. So those would be my criteria. Um, access to water. I don't want to go to the pole. I don't want to have six months, well, actually 12 months of, of dark and 12 months of light. I want to have reasonable situation with the day-night cycles, which, okay, we have at San Francisco. Uh, and the um, access to water and interesting science, because I am, I mean, there's two things that make Mars of great interest. One is science, it's the Rosetta Stone for letting us know the truth about uh, the potential uh, prevalence and diversity of life in the universe. And the other is Mars is the new frontier where a new branch of human civilization uh, can be born and where humanity can begin transforming itself into a space faring species. And so um, I'd like a site that has promise for both of those objectives and I think we can find them. Uh one concern that cropped up in my mind is, uh, you know, in keeping with this idea of anti-humanism, there are indeed people uh, on this earth today who view human beings as a cancer on the planet earth. So I suppose it shouldn't come as a surprise that these same people might view human beings as a cancer on any other world we choose to visit. So uh, do you think these merchants of despair, as you might call them, uh, might seek to keep Mars untouched by human footprints or failing that. Yeah, yeah sure. Or failing Absolutely. that to prevent human beings from landing in some of the most interesting places on the planet Mars where we would have the best chance of finding uh, microbial life. Yeah, th th that's uh, all true. In fact, uh, last year, there was a major freak out from this crowd uh, about some people uh, having sent some tardigrades to the moon. Um, in the Israeli lander. Uh, and this was like totally absurd. And um, so violating forward contamination protocols, and demanding prosecution of the people involved for this horrendous effect. Okay, which is all just absolute nonsense. Uh, okay, we brought more than a lot more than tardigrades to the moon in Apollo. Okay, um, we left plenty of organic material behind on the moon. Uh, and the entire purpose of the program, broadly speaking, is to spread life from Earth. 
okay? That's the purpose. That's why we want to go to the moon. That's why we want to go to Mars. That's why we want to go to space, okay? And it's human beings as the vanguard of the community of life from the Earth. Um, and now if you think that humans are intrinsically evil, that anything we do is wrong, okay? And, you know, you sometimes get this in this so-called terraforming ethics debate. Would it be ethical to terraform Mars? Let's put aside the question of technical feasibility. Would it be right to do it, to take Mars as it is now and turn it into a fully living Earth like the Earth? Okay, and how could anyone say that is wrong? If you were to ask any environmentalist or frankly, an oil company executive, okay, what do you think of the idea of taking Earth as it is now and turning it into a lifeless desert like Mars with maybe a few bacteria in the groundwater? They'd say, are you out of your mind? Okay, um, right? That would be a massive crime of environmental degradation. Well, if it's a massive crime of environmental degradation to turn a blooming living Earth into a desert Mars with maybe a few surviving bacteria in the groundwater, then what a miracle it would be to do the reverse. Okay, and to say that it would somehow be wrong because it's wrong is just saying that anything that humans do, okay, whether it's killing a living planet or bringing a dead planet to life is equally wrong and that can't be okay and the so there is that now the uh now in terms of uh this other thing um which uh, it, it attempts to mask itself with some degree of rationality of well you can go to mars someday once we know that there either is or is not life on mars and have adequately characterized it, okay? Well, this is also baloney um, because first of all, if you don't send people to Mars, you will never be able to get a negative thing because you will never be able to do a thorough program of exploring Mars with just robots, okay? And you need a very thorough program if you're gonna make a negative conclusion, okay? Um, secondly, in terms of a positive conclusion, um, what we need to do to find life on Mars, we'll probably need to drill to reach the groundwater because that's, if there's life on Mars, the most probable place to find it is in underground liquid water. And that requires setting up drilling rigs, getting down there, bringing up water, bringing it to the surface, looking at it, culturing it, seeing if there's anything in it is live and characterizing it because we wanna know if there is life on Mars, is it similar to Earth life? Does it use the same genetic alphabet? You know, DNA, RNA? Okay, you know, here we Americans and the French and the Spanish and the Germans, we all use the Latin alphabet. The Russians don't use the same alphabet. They have a Cyrillic alphabet, which is different, but it has a common origin. There are principles of similarity between the two, okay? On the other hand, the Chinese have an alphabet that is totally different and does not have a common origin at all. It works on completely different principles. The, 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 so if there's life on Mars, does it use the Latin alphabet, the Cyrillic alphabet, Chinese alphabet? In other words, does it have a common origin? Okay, uh, or, or not. Uh, and the, now this idea that you would not know. Okay, look, if you go to Mars and you find something that's different, it uses a different alphabet or even just you know, different words with those alphabets. That is and it's same. obvious. Bacteria that do use DNA and RNA, but not of a kind that we're familiar with. Uh, at that point, you say, it was native. Okay, now what if it's just bacteria that are exactly like the kind that we see every day on Earth? How would you know whether they were native or not? Well, if they're native, by definition, they were there before you got there. And therefore, they will have left residues, fossils, other biomarkers. And so if you go I, to I Mars, love the analogy. I love the analogy that you've used before of uh, if you were to get on a plane and fly to France, how do you know that there are French people in France uh, or that they got there at the, the same day that you got there, that they all flew there? Well, there's substantial evidence of... That they were there before you landed, right. Right. The, uh, there's a lot of buildings here, okay? Uh, <laughs> They weren't set up in the 
There's cemeteries with French people inside, you know, entombed yeah, in them. Yeah, there's cemeteries with French, and there's the Arc de Triomphe, and so forth, and Eiffel Tower, and all this. You, right, so if, if the bacteria were there before you got there, they will have left biomarkers. And the idea that this would not prove they were native is equivalent to that of the creationists who say that the existence of fossils do not prove the existence of life on Earth prior to people, okay? Because God could have created the Earth with the fossils in it. Um, so this is just creationism. It's pure nonsense. I would hope that uh, science would prevail and the curiosity, once human beings are able to land on Mars, the curiosity about microbial life will, will lead us to investigate the sites that show uh, the most promise. But uh, clearly this, these ideas, as bizarre as they may be, uh, have some uh, influence on people at NASA because that was, to my understanding, what led them to crash the Cassini space probe into Saturn's atmosphere to prevent the very remote chance that it might contaminate uh, one of Saturn's moons if it were left uh, in orbit around Saturn. Sure, and that's what, just three or four billion dollars of the taxpayer's property? Uh, so I, I don't think they should have done that. Uh, I think that's irresponsible. And um, Clearly there are people worried about it though, which is so strange. I think those people need to be reassigned uh because for someone to destroy uh a first class spacecraft uh out of, of of such neurotic concerns is is it's inappropriate that they should be running anything in the government well i would tend to agree with you um so as i said earlier uh, perhaps we're getting uh, ahead of ourselves but uh, you have said and and i love this that Mars is not the final destination. Mars is a direction. And mm -hmm. I, I know that you've spoken a little bit about Saturn's moon Titan. And if human beings can master travel to Mars, which is no small feat, then uh, I, I wonder where we go from there and what that roadmap uh, looks like. Do we send human beings to Titan? You also talked about um, sending... I know you've got a book, but you also talked about, uh, you, you've talked okay. about uh, transporting uh, helium-3 from Saturn, Uranus, uh, Neptune using uh, nuclear indigenous uh, thermal rockets or NIFs. And so that's obviously a big part of uh, your most recent book. Yeah, The Case for Space. Now, Mars is the direction. Mars is the challenge for our time. Um, but it's not the final destination by any means. The, we're, got, we're bound for the stars here. And, um, you know, we'll go to Mars using chemical propulsion. We can get there in six months. Um, and, you know, in the 19th century, that's how long it took to sail from England to Australia, and hundreds of thousands of people did it. But once we're on Mars, um, there's going to be a tremendous driver for advancing uh, all sorts of space technologies, including notably propulsion. So, you know, Columbus sailed the Atlantic in some ships that even 50 years later, no one would have attempted to sail the Atlantic. Okay, because there weren't Atlantic capable ships because there wasn't Atlantic travel. But once there was, then they moved from these, you know, Mediterranean class vessels into Atlantic class three-masted caravels, and then there were clipper ships and steamboats and ocean liners, and eventually Boeing 747s. And, um, you know, um, some of us who have uh, immigrant uh, uh, ancestors in um, uh, living history, uh, you know, are acquainted with the stories of people coming over on, on, on tramp steamers and what that was like and, and so forth. And yet here we are, uh, we travel to Europe in jets and get there in six hours or something watching movies. Uh, and, and I think, you know, the grandchildren of the first Martian settlers will listen with wonder to the tales of their grandparents who talk about these six month voyages to Mars and cramped quarters and so forth when, when they're doing it all the time in two weeks in fusion powered spacecraft and the, in luxurious accommodations. And the, um, and those same 
fusion-powered spacecraft that makes, uh, you know, traveling to Mars a matter of, of, of routine and ease uh, will make possible uh, more difficult voyages to Titan and eventually even the stars um, and for those willing to undertake them. So each step prepares the next. Each step prepares the next. Do you think uh, under the most ideal circumstances that interstellar travel could be within humanity's grasp within perhaps the next century or so? I, I think so, yes, within the next century or so. Um, and, um, and particularly if, if this fusion power entrepreneurial revolution brings that into existence because fusion rockets, you could get exhaust velocities of, of 7% or so the speed of light and a, a rocket with pro proper engineering could achieve up to about twice its exhaust velocity. And uh, so you're talking about being able to travel above 10% the speed of light, which represents a marginal capability for interstellar travel. Just a few decades away, the nearest stars would be. Yes, that's right. So, and then furthermore, as I discuss in the book, um, I believe that there's major discoveries waiting to be made, including in areas like physics. I do not believe that physics as it is currently known is a complete science. Okay. Uh, I think that we've only read the first three chapters of the book. And um, because it doesn't make sense. The Big Bang does not make sense. We can't reconcile uh, quantum physics and general relativity, really. We can't. That is also true. But the, you know, I believe the Big Bang happened, but I don't believe that there's physics that can account for it, which means there's physics waiting to be discovered. Um, and uh, so, and when new laws of physics are discovered, new forces, uh, new powers over nature come into existence. And um, think of all the powers we have through the discovery of the laws of electromagnetism that were essentially unknown prior to 1800. Now, I mean, here we are communicating uh, thousands of miles instantly with video pictures, I'm talking to you. This is absolute magic from the point of view of someone in 1800. Absolutely. Um, and the um, so uh, I, I, and well, what does space have to do with this? Well, the greatest lab in the universe is the universe, and um, the best place to do astronomy is space. And, you know, historically, astronomy has led the development of physics. The, the laws of gravity, which led to the discovery of the laws of classical physics, were discovered through astronomy, okay? As Newton's work was a product of astronomical research. Uh, and so there's the laws of classical physics. And the, um, much of electromagnetism came from astronomy. And uh, certainly relativity came from astronomy. And um, the the in discovery of nuclear fusion came from astronomy, and so I think there's fantastic forces at play in the universe, and we will discover them through space-based astronomy. So, you know, uh, NASA has um, at least concepts right now for next-generation space astronomical observatories, and if the cost of space launch goes down. Uh, these and many other uh, larger and smaller uh, will be done and there will be discoveries. And so things that see, seem inconceivable now will become conceivable. I have uh, just one final question uh, before we conclude things today. And that is what in your opinion do you think is the biggest misconception that perhaps laymen have about sending human beings to Mars? Um, well, that it would just be a stunt, a flags and footprints thing. It's just something to do to um, perhaps um, make a statement about national glory or, or to give contractors some money. Uh, I think 
that this is If we do it, it will be uh, among the most important achievements of our age. It will be, be the beginning of a new phase in human history. You know, in the 90s, after the Soviet bloc fell apart, there are people who wrote books saying, uh, called The End of History. Okay, that is, well, okay, uh, we've wound that up and everything important has now been done. And, uh, and there was another book uh, written by a very um, scientifically literate person. In fact, I think he was the editor of Scientific American uh, called The End of Science. There's nothing new to be discovered. Uh, so, you know, it was a lot of fun, this whole science thing. Uh, and uh, you can read about it, um, but it's done. Um, and I don't think we've reached the end of history. I think we're living at the beginning of history. And um, the history of humankind as a multi-planet space species. I think that if we do it, then 500 years from now, there will be humans, there'll be cities, not only on Mars and elsewhere in the solar system, but on hundreds of planets orbiting stars in this region of the galaxy. Hundreds of new branches of human civilization, new languages, new literatures, new cultural traditions, new political traditions, uh, uh, multitudes of sources for uh, uh, discoveries and, and inventions and, and technology, uh, and, uh, and, 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 and tales of heroic deeds that will be used to inspire other people and to go even further in developing this magnificent interstellar culture. And when they look back on this time, they will view it as the beginning of history. Just like, you know, we could look back on the humans leaving Africa as sort of the beginning of human history as from the trans, forming ourselves from a local African biological curiosity into a global species and then a global civilization with hundreds of nations and all of that. And uh, so this is something truly magnificent. And, uh, you know, we're present at the creation. It's I, our honor to be among the creators. I can think of uh, no other message more inspiring to conclude uh, this interview with. And I hope... Uh, all of our listeners for this podcast will check out your latest book, The Case for Space, as well as uh, the other wonderful books that you've done about uh, Mars and uh, earthly history and politics as well. All right. Well, thank you very much. This has been great. It's been an honor. Mm -hmm.